My name is Stanley Sword and it's a great pleasure to welcome Gary Larsson, Thank professor you. in leadership from the Military Academy here in Sweden. Right. And uh, Sweden is known for having the longest peace in the world, almost 200 years. Yeah, that's right. Over 200 years, actually. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. And so what, what have we learned about leadership during these 200 years? Because it's one thing to be trial by fire, so to say, in, in real combat. And it's another thing to, to lead during peace. That, that, that's true, but society as a whole has changed immensely during these, those 200 years, hasn't it? And I think uh, the military forces are also very, very different nowadays from, from that time. Mm. And in the later uh, 20, 30 years, Sweden has been quite active also in international military missions led by the United Nations or part of a NATO mm. force. So nowadays, many of the higher Swedish officers, they have actually combat experience uh, from Afghanistan or Mali or different areas mm. of conflict. And how, how, how are you able to grow as a leader, uh, an officer? Is it only in, 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 in trial by fire? Can you read yourself to become a better leader as well? Partly. Uh, I think you have to recognize that there is a a rather detailed process of selection first. In order to become an officer, you have to pass certain stages, psychological testing, interviewing, etc. You do your basic training. So it's a stepwise selection. Uh, uh, so those who end up as officers going abroad on military missions, they are a select group mm. among the better ones, the more mentally stable ones. Mm. Uh, and then uh, we've seen that maybe one of the strongest uh, sources of how you learn leadership is uh, role models. You look at uh, guys who are a little bit older than yourself, one or two more stars mm. uh, on their shoulders. Just like you here then. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, look, uh -huh, that, that was smart, the way he did it or she did it, or that was very stupid, I would never do it that way. So. You learn a lot from good role models, and you also learn from feedback. Mm. Sometimes pretty hard feedback, but mm. many times constructive feedback. Mm. And uh, you said that the, 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 the group, the, the sizes of the groups you lead, yeah. has been quite similar for the past 2,000 years. Yeah, almost. It's rather interesting because in the Old Testament, mm. in the second book of Moses, I think it's called that in English, Moses got the advice from God that he was, when he was to take the Israeli people from Egypt to the holy country, they should pick out men who could lead groups of 10, of 50, of 100, and 1,000. Mm. And that's pretty much military organization still. And it's actually pretty much the, or, the way almost any major organization is set up. Yeah. Hierarchy seems to be a long-time survivor. Yeah, <laughs> and and what differ what different skills is required for these three different sizes of leadership well, models? Well, there are huge differences because if you lead a group of ten, mm. you're very close to them. You see them every day. You, you may be picked up from from one of them. You know the task very well, mm. and you get immediate feedback of the performance of the group. It's rather task-oriented. Uh, if you advance, you, you get further away from the actual action. Mm. Uh, if you end up at the very highest level, you, you may get feedback, a very long feedback delay. Mm. If you're at the governmental level, for instance, you, you may get feedback once a year. How is this regiment doing? That's very different. Uh, and uh, decision-making becomes much more complex when you reach higher levels. It uh, has a longer time duration. You make decisions buying new aircrafts, for instance, which are supposed to work for 20 years. Uh, and, and many of these decisions are so common. You can never make everybody pleased. Some will like it, some will not. Mm. Uh, at the group level, it's easier. Uh, but it's different. And, and how do you motivate people? If you look at, like, Winston Churchill, you, you, yeah. there's all these famous speeches, and, and he kind of molded the whole right. United Kingdom together to, to persevere 
d- 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 towards victory, yeah. victory or nothing. <laughs> and and how, what can we learn from him? And how can you learn from other people who, who motivate and inspire groups? I think that's also it's. What you do is a little bit different depending on if you lead 10 or if you lead thousands and thousands or a whole nation. If you lead 10, it's very much personalized, uh, mm-hmm. personalized feedback and encouragement. Come on now, uh, etc. And uh, if you lead at the national level, it's more ideals. Uh, but that can be done differently. And some of those methods are maybe not that attractive, that you picture your enemy in very negative Words. And I think you see something of that in politics these days with nationalism growing and uh, we, them. But it has a motivating effect on many people, unfortunately. Mm. Uh, so, but still there are, of course, good leaders who can motivate many, many people by having high ideals. And actually, if you do what you say, mm. it tends to impress people. If you say A and then do B, yeah, uh, not say good. Yeah, lead by example. Yeah, and if you want to lead yourself, right, you know, to get up early in the morning, go out yeah. running, building a new body, building a new mind. How? What can you learn from from your leadership tools and and from the history of leaders in order to lead ourselves? I think you can learn a couple of things. One thing is that you have to accept individual differences. People are different. Some people like to get up very early, do their exercises. Like Gary. Like myself. And some do it late in the evening. Or mm. function very well in the evening when I'm very tired. Uh, so you have to accept individual. You have to find your own way. But when we train leaders, we put a lot of emphasis on self-leadership. To lead others, it's a great advantage to have a minimum of self-awareness. What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? And uh, work on your weaknesses, uh, etc. So how much work should you do in your weaknesses and how much work should you do in your strengths? If you want to become world-class on something. Here in Sweden, it seems a lot of times in school, like we we, we work most with the weakest individuals, but in Russia, Mm. they they put the most effort into the, the stars, so to say. I think once again you cannot generalize. If you want to reach really a world top performance, I think you have to develop your strengths. You need a lot of talent from the beginning and then to further develop that. But when it comes to more general leadership, I think one very interesting fact, we have seen it, other researchers have seen it, and you can simply state it like bad is stronger than good. And that means that bad leadership has stronger negative effects than good leadership has positive effects. Mm. And that means that for many not so good leaders, it really pays off to work on their weaknesses. Yeah, uh, That could mean more than to develop the very good ones to super good ones. But if you want to read world class, mm. you have to develop the super good ones. Mm. Uh, but for the majority, it's interesting. Well, then you have to dig in deeper. What are the specifics of uh, bad leadership? How does it... Uh, mm. how what is bad leadership? We, we've seen basically two broad classes. One is more active. You're arrogant, you're dominant, you press people too much. Uh, a little bit of lack of impulse control. The other, um, the other is more passive. It's laissez-faire. It's... Uh, being messy, you do not need to have a destructive intention, but the Mm. consequence for your group is destructive. Mm. And if you do, this is interesting, I think, because if you do research, long-term research on it, it seems that the passive forms of destructive leadership are worse than the active, arrogant forms. Mm. And I think one reason is that if the arrogance becomes too emphasized, it's, it's noticeable people mm. higher up in the art will, will take action. Mm. But the passive front, they can be k- nice people. You like them, but nothing happens. The mm. problems are still the same two years later, and people uh, adapt to this. And, uh, and that creates uh, sick absentism. 
is the research made on, on which is the most effective way to lead people? I mean, we have micromanagement where yeah. you go into every corner of, of the office or, or you give people a, a task how, and you don't tell them how to solve it, just what, yeah. what result is being asked for, of them. And which, is, which is the... The, the best way to uh, get well, well cost the, the, simple answer, group. the simple answer is it depends uh, it, it depends a lot on uh, what what type of task and how motivated and how competent are the people you are supposed to lead if they're complete beginners having no clue about what to do then you need a firm leadership if mm. they're very competent like in my case for instance doctoral students super mm. competent super motivated it would be disastrous to be very directive with them. Then you need to give them a lot of freedom and many times they develop the, the issue much further than you could have done yourself. Mm. So it depends uh, on the situation. But given the higher educational level in modern society, I think more and more uh, working places would uh, benefit from a, uh, a little bit... More freedom, uh, mm. more delegation, not just a boring task, but real delegation of developing tasks. And, mm. uh, and, and since, uh, you know, warriors and, and militaries ha ha has, has uh, been for, for thousands of years, uh, the way to, you know, develop their skills and yeah. the military uh, schools... In, in the US, you have West Point and other academies. Uh -huh. uh, if you trace them back in time, yeah. how has they developed and, and what have they learned from history? That's a very difficult question. I can only, I can see, uh, well, let me put it this way. I think the uh, so development in society in the late 60s, uh, student revolution, etc. In, in Sweden, for instance, and in many Western European countries, it had a huge impact on officer education. Uh, the old, very authoritarian style became more or less abandoned. Mm. They started using, or we started using group dynamic exercises, for instance, with a focus on self-awareness, learn about yourself, and uh, communicate in a reasonable way with people. Uh, and I th it has worked very well. So that's a major difference. Yeah. Uh, and I think one of the major issues with this is in order to perform well in super stressful situations, mm. we need trust. I need to trust you because my life depends on, on you and your life depends on me. Yeah. And, you, and you build trust better with a more democratic uh, way of leadership. Mm. People uh, want to do the work instead of being just told to Yeah, do and we, we develop together and learn how, that we can trust mm. each other. And so you work both in the in the academic world and in the military world, and then you have the the, the sports world, and you have the the yeah. business world. You have these four different cornerstones of of, uh, of leadership. What can they learn from each other? And what is uh, what is uh, you know what stands out from from uh, every group? I think one thing that stands out in sports is that performance is so obvious and so easy to measure. And, and you also work a lot with younger people in sports. Mm. Uh, out in working life, uh, there are many old guys like myself. <laughs> and uh, so that's a major difference. And, it's uh, hard to learn old dogs how to sit. Uh, well, it, it is possible, but <laughs> it's easier to learn young dogs yeah. how to sit. And uh, I think if you take peak performance, I think there are a lot of similarities. Mm. Uh, I think one basic question which relates more or less to them is what happens if I make a mistake? If you make a severe mistake at the top athlete level, you're out. Mm. If you're a uh, physician, a uh, surgeon who make a mistake, the patient may die. Mm. Uh, it's not that crucial in research, for instance, because you don't die the next second, the guy who reads my stupid paper. Mm. But your, your career may be wrecked if you write a stupid paper. And uh, mm. So I think it's a, all these, uh, at the top level, they're all very performance-oriented. Mm. And I think individuals who have this performance orientation will have an advantage. And, and what stands out more? What, what's the kind of key ingredients in... in, in 
business life and in the, the academic world and military leadership? I think there are major differences in one respect and that the military, it's, it has a very, very long, more collective uh, ethos, the group before the individual. Mm-hmm. In, in order to win the war, you have to coordinate a lot of people's efforts. I think in business, that's partly true, but it's also more individual. My performance and, and research is extremely individual, yeah. and so is sports. So it's individualism versus collectivism. And in business, it's possible to change. You can go from Pepsi to Cola yeah. and go to war with your former employee, but then in the military world, it's more or less you, you live in the same organism throughout yeah. your whole life. Yeah. I think it's a little bit the same in uh, in medicine. Mm. Uh, the labor market narrows down, and you you're supposed to stay in that mm. area and uh, do your career there. Mm. Uh, so, can you give us an example from from each group of a great leader? I think if you look at the military, the. the those who are more catchy people out on the battlefield, uh, Hormel, Montgomery, uh, what's the name of the American general in Kuwait? Schwarzkopf. Yes, he was. I mean, they, they all have... Uh, they have better names before <laughs> yeah. than today. And they all have, uh, at least the, the modern ones, uh, have like some... Poli- they work very well in television. Mm. Uh, break through the glass, as we say in Sweden. I don't know if mm. that's correct in English, but um, I think in business, many of the great leaders are a little bit uh, one step behind. Uh, they do not like to show off in the same. They, I think, a typical example would be the leading Swedish private family for almost a, day, a century, Wallenberg. Mm. Uh, they act without uh, being in the middle of media visible being visible and they have a lot of impact on what's going on mm. uh, and in the academic world i mean it's it's uh, i interviewed a lot of uh, nobel prize winners yeah. to build these teams yeah. today and then 40 50 years later you perhaps get the nobel prize of the of the fruits that you harvest yeah. uh, but it was in passion from from the start how do you what you can what can you learn about leadership there? How do you build great teams that perform at their maximum level? I think you mentioned one word that's passion. Uh, it's a little bit trickier nowadays because the young people they value other aspects of life higher. It's difficult to find many people with this uh, six to seventy hours a week passion because the young ones they have families etc and other things they want to do. But I think passion is an ingredient. It's an important ingredient. And, um, but nowadays it's also different because now it's much, very much about branding, using social media, etc., which is, uh, I myself am an analphabetic regarding social media. I think it's a total waste of time. But mm. the young ones are very good at it. Mm. And uh, I think you have to be. You have to be good at branding. And what advice can you give to young people today? What's the three best pieces of advice? How to grow as a leader? How to, to, if you want to, enter that world? Know yourself, particularly the interpersonal, how you function with other people. Whom are you good at reaching? Whom are you... creates bad feelings within you and why? Find out more about that. Explore yourself. Mm. Uh, Look for good role models. And uh, and have the courage to test. If you do not test yourself out of the box, you're going to end up within the box and maybe not fully use your potential. What seemed impossible yesterday is easy today. Maybe yeah. a little bit exaggerated, but yeah. uh, I think know yourself uh, uh, well, what I said. And I, I just read a book about the, the Vikings yeah. uh, a thousand years ago. And and they were you know they were willing to give their life on the battlefield with their axes and and the, yeah. was a lot of passion. Um, is there any in in the in in history that stand that stands out? Any leaders or or any you know times uh, special uh, centuries that you 
think about when you think about great military leadership in the past? You have Alexander the Great, you know, who led yeah, the, uh, the... down to India. From I think Greece. it's difficult uh, to really evaluate what's what's written in history books and who's interested is it that lies behind what the printed words in history books. But if you look at the more recent ones, uh, it's also different if you look at the political level. I've, I guess, for instance, that Winston Churchill had a huge impact on the willpower of the English people uh, in when times were really, really hard. And... Uh, contribute to definitely to the victory. I think uh, Gorbachev made an impact in the, this uh, change of the Soviet Union to Russia. It would probably have happened, but he, I think it accelerated with his uh, when he stepped out of the car in New York mm. and shook hands with the American people. That was a symbolic action. And uh, mm. I think you can find some of these. Uh, when it comes to military leaders, it's all, almost always more popular to picture the ones who are great on the battlefield and those who are great at the higher levels uh, because that's more catchy but I think there are good leaders at both levels mm. but. and if you look ahead how will leadership transform in the next 25 years <laughs> will it disrupt in some way <laughs> Maybe. I think some skills will are evergreens they will be just as important in 100 years as they are now that's the interpersonal side, social skills mm. I think if it's a group of 10 or if it's leader of the government, uh, you need a social skills uh, and you need a, um, even at high levels, you need to signal a certain amount of personal warmth. Yeah. I, I care about you, mm. even if we don't meet like this, if I just meet you on the television or whatever. Mm. I think that's uh, stable. But I think the uh, change is that you must individualize more. People have different needs and uh, mm. the general economic development has made it possible to be more selective at the individual level if I want to work with you or some other guy. And if you cannot adapt your work so it fits me, I will go to the other guy. Mm. I think it will less collective planning and more individualized uh, adaptation and working conditions and uh, people will work more from at a distance uh, all these technology or based mm. alterations. And if you think about AI, uh, mm. when, when, when the machines become smarter than us, yeah. uh, and in chess and Go it's already happened, it's, uh, right. <laughs> it's uh, how, how, how will that transform leadership when the machines are in control? Uh, if you look at science fiction movies, you see the wars between man and machine and so on. Yeah. How, how, How will that change leadership when 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 the machines are are you know kind of on the other side? We I think we we don't know very much about it. We we do know that the, there is some research now in related to selection that machines sometimes in at least in certain kinds of jobs perform better than. Uh, selection specialist psychologist for instance or human relations uh, resources experts mm. uh, particularly when it comes to a little bit more routine jobs mm. uh, there is some kind of standard algorithm you have to go through and the machine can do it more reliably yeah uh, than, than, a, than a human can because it doesn't look like a bright future if we will be led by machines, if we would be led by robots and AI. AI uh... Particularly for older guys like me, it seems very <laughs> alienated way of living. Yeah. Uh, maybe the young ones who are grow up with grow, grow up with it uh, perceive it differently. That, that's a big question mark. Because mm. uh, it goes in two separate ways. The individual list is greater now than ever yeah. in the new generation, right. as sometimes as the AI will kind of make great shifts in the future. So, so, uh, but, but for an individualistic person, it doesn't seem like a great thing to work for a robot. No, but it seems, to, if you take the worst scenarios, it means that the very few people, those who can program these robots, they will have a fantastic life. Mm. While the other ones, 
We'll, we'll, uh, and will it sh- will it shift military leadership as well? When we, you, you already have drones, you know, yeah. no drones on the sky here. <laughs> but uh, uh, will it shift uh, when we have you know uh, a thousand robots, a thousand an army of robots, so to say, that we should lead? Well, one thing which has been observed frequently is that the closer physically you are to the enemy, like this for instance, mm. uh, it becomes very stressful if I had a knife and would... Uh, but if I was sitting in a safe place on the other side of the globe yeah. with a drone, uh-huh, uh, there he is, mm. <laughs> press the button. Mm. Uh, I, I talked to a guy in America, he was sitting uh, in a very safe place in the Midwest, uh, steering drones over uh, Afghanistan, mm. uh, leaving the kids at the daycare center, going to this working place, pressing some bombs, and then go pick up the kids again. Yeah, and I said it's a kind of a very strange life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, uh, that's a really shift. Uh, uh, yeah, there have actually been some studies on post-traumatic stress uh, among those who uh, have to, as part of their job. Mm act violently at a distance, mm. never see their enemy, never see... They, they know that this, this will disrupt people's lives, mm. but they they are miles and miles away. And where the buck stops? Who should take responsibility for, for what? Because as a military person, you should be able to say no. Yeah. But it's hard to say no, should I press this button or not, a thousand miles away. Yeah. It's, then, 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 then if you are out in the bushes, so to say. Yeah. But I think it puts an extra emphasis on good leadership. Uh, I know many nations, they have an expectancy that every soldier or officer who gets an order, which he or she thinks is morally completely wrong, yeah. has the duty to say no. Mm. That's theory. In reality, it's, of course, difficult mm. to act against the will of your boss. Yeah. Uh, so uh... exciting mm. and, and a little frightful. Gary, the best of luck on your future endeavors. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>